Alistair, thank you so much. Can I, everyone hear me? Oh, live stream, sorry. So this is actually working. Um, <laughs> I get choked up <laughs> when I talk about these boats. So we're going to have to work through this together a little bit. <laughs> we're going to start right with the good stuff. Built in the USA in our new North Carolina plant. This is the gunboat 55. A view of sort of the uh, living space and the operating space of the boat. It's really a whole new layout. <laughs> we, um, we built fast all carbon cats. We have some unique issues. There's a lot of apparent wind. If you don't put the right shape in the top sides, the boats can be wet. We're trying to cater to a very diverse and broad market. People always ask me, are you marketing to a demographic? The answer is <clears throat> no. Um, it's a psychographic. People ask me what a psychographic is. Um, I don't know. Somebody told me that's what we're doing. <laughs> we're marketing to people that want the absolute pinnacle of around the world cruising boats. They demand the absolute best equipment, the best performance. Um, they want to go sailing with people they love. That's family, spouses, friends. They want to be comfortable. Now, a lot of these things run counter to what sailing means to a lot of people. I know that a lot of us love to lean over all day long wear foul weather gear, yell at each other from stem to stern. Um, frankly, that didn't work so well for me. Um, so this is, this is a layout that was derived ah, from 15 years of working on this segment. <coughs> um, you're going to note that the steering is indoors. In front of the steering here, is the entire sail handling area. The two inches, all the jammers, clutches. Um, in front of the sail handling area is a sliding forward door. You can either have the forward area open or closed, and you can barely see it, but over the wheel and the switch plinth is a moonroof. It's a giant moonroof. It's about uh, a meter and a half by two meters. So in nice conditions, you open up the boat, the forward doors, the moonroof. This aft area has a very high end enclosure. Uh, you can remove the enclosure completely like this photo shows. And the layout's really indoor and outdoor. It really picks up on everything we've learned about these boats over 15 years. It's a trend that <clears throat> I think is a bit unique for the sailing world and that when you're sailing in the English Channel or Holland where it seems to rain or be foggy as well you can close the doors close the moonroof and fully enclose the back end of the boat getting to this point took 25 prior projects seven different series total of 70 owners 2 million sea miles 110,000 miles of my own on my own boats. And um, it was a long path to get here. This isn't something that you wave your wand and there's some new innovation. I think that behind anything that really <coughs> seems completely new, it's probably a very long <coughs> and painful process to get there. We started in 1999. It started while I was barfing overboard. <laughs> I had what I thought was the ultimate blue water cruising boat. I had a Nelson Merrick 68 sled that had won the Transpac. 
I converted it into a blue water cruiser and I said, right, let's go. Packed up the kids, my spouse, headed to the Caribbean for a season after selling Escape and being fired. And um, we are sailing north along the uh, Windwards or Lourdes, I forget which. And if any of you have spent uh, some time in the Caribbean, you've got wind blowing all the way from Africa. You've got waves stacking up all the way from Africa. Then it hits the Caribbean shelf. And then it funnels between these steep shorelines. And when you leave the northern points of these islands, unusual to see 20 foot waves, 40 knot gust, and on my keelboat that I worked 12 years to own, uh, we went through this corkscrew motion, and I believe I was the first to barf, then my daughter, then my son, and then my wife. And uh, after we'd emptied the contents of our stomachs, we looked up, and there's a cheap French production cat pacing us, and I'm sailing one of the faster keelboats around at the time. They have a baguette. They have a bottle of wine. <laughs> it's on the salon table. And they look perfectly relaxed, and they're not leaned over. And for me, that was an epiphany moment. I think my exact words were, screw this. We're sailing the boat to Fort Lauderdale, and we're unloading it, which we did. Um, they say that. Um, <laughs> new things happen when you can't find <clears throat> stuff you want. And having gone through uh, the 49er development with Martin Wadhams, where are you, Martin? Raise your hand. There's a brother in serious product development and refinement and containment of Aussie designers. Um, there was no offshore high-performance cruising cat. <laughs> Seems crazy. This is 1999, early 2000. All the boats are polyester. They weigh more than a double-decker English bus. Probably sail like one, too. Um, and so I wasn't happy with any of the solutions on the market. And uh, having just sold a couple of companies all in the boating world, I was really looking for something to do. And um, had a pretty good idea that this was a segment that, while it didn't exist, probably had some potential moving forward. So I uh, hand drew a 50-foot a performance cat. And uh, then had some professional drawings done up by Marilyn Melvin. and. Um, then a good friend saw the drawings, and he says, no, 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 I need 70. Let's do this together. Well, I said, how about 60? And if any of you know my friend Clint, he goes, no, 62. So we compromised a little bit on his side of the size range. And that started the beginning of Gunboat. Uh, this is the Gunboat 62 Tribe, which we started in the project in 2000. She launched in late 2001. Um, we sailed out of Cape Town, and uh, frankly, none of us had any idea how to sail this boat. It was the most terrifying thing I've ever done. Um, you would sail upwind at 13 to 14 knots to test the boat thoroughly. We would fly the hull. Um, you should have heard some of the comments about how stupid we were when we are doing this. When we crossed the South Atlantic, we had a giant roller furling screecher, unheard of at the time. Everyone said you have to have a, a spinnaker, a symmetrical spinnaker off both bows. Well, this is apparent when sailing. Um, Tribe has hit a top speed of 36.7 knots. It once hit 34 knots with my wife on watch alone <clears throat> somewhere between Newport and Bermuda, and she's not a sailor. Um, I said, what are you doing? It's time to shorten sail. She says, I got it. She shows me the remote, and she says, when the gust comes, I bear off a few degrees. When a lull comes, I head up to get the speed on again. <laughs> I didn't sleep the rest of my off watch. <laughs> and when I came up on watch, 
I promptly shortened sail to keep it down under 20. <clears throat> Sorry, so these first couple of years, first five years, were really proof of concept, um, really learning how to sail these boats, really learning who our market was. And I would say first and foremost, learning what you don't know. <laughs> Um, all these boats were built with subcontractors in Cape Town. Uh, at the time, it was a real golden period down there. Small yards, great attention to detail, um, great cost, and um, they are mom and pop shops. The next five years, one of those yards went insolvent on me. Any of you that's built big boats, I'm sure you've been through somebody, you know somebody that's been through the process you got one or two choices, refund the yard and pray to God they can finish the boat or just take over the yard, and that's what we did. We ended up taking over two yards, setting up a facility in Cape Town. And these next five years were really about trying to explore what sizes work for the customers and really learning how big a boat an owner-operator could go before you needed crew, and then uh, delivering a lot more luxury, uh, upping the design ante, starting to involve interior architects, exterior architects, and going to all carbon boats. The first two boats were e-glass and carbon. Everything from 2003 onward has been all carbon. Um, this is the gunboat 90, which um, has been known to sail upwind at about 16 knots. Off the wind, they're too scared to push it to find out what her real top speed is. Um, we know she's hit 40. Um, this boat has sailed four years. The owner sails 220 days straight every day, covers at least 60 to 100 miles a day. For a boat of this size, it's a pretty remarkable feat. Most boats in this size range would have a uh, sort of service and support cycle that was probably 10 days to one day of sailing. Uh, this boat has about 30 days of service a year for 200 days of sailing. So over the course of what I would call the Cape Town period, we, we really learned to make bomb-proof boats with really terrific systems. We learned how to load up a lot of luxury in these boats and also get the weight out with systems, with electrical bus systems and learning how to run plumbing and wiring for your shortest cable lengths, and uh, just the ongoing refinement of the original concept that was Tribe. 2009, I would call this the embarrassment period um, in terms of assumptions, in terms of challenges, uh, but also probably one of our most productive periods creatively. We put together an all new design team uh, we had interior and exterior architects. We had full-on system architects, um, naval architects, and we're going at the product as though we're developing a super yacht or some sort of high-level consumer product, whether it's a car or something else. A um, couple of things I'll point out in this photo. The hull shapes now mostly have this chine. Chine stiffens the hull, but its main purpose is we learned with the earlier boats, if you have a slab side, it sends spray up in sheets. And this chine has made the boats remarkably dry. Um, the second thing is this gentle radius between the hull and the wing deck really redirects water so you don't get the slap on the underside of the boat like the older boats used to have. China is an interesting step in our evolution. We really felt the need to get costs down. Um, but I can tell you with five years of producing boats over there, if I can save any of you grief, do not build stuff in China. It doesn't work. We got out some terrific composites with a lot of Western expats. The composites are beautiful. They put in so many hours in this boat, the finish is actually remarkably good trying to get to the, um, the trouble-free 
problem-free, terrific boat, yacht, that we're used to delivering is a real challenge. Even with full-time people there, um, we end up doing too much rework when we get the boats. Um, so China was a real critical step for us. I'm very grateful for the yard that built the boats for us in that it helped us move on from Cape Town, a place that's a terrific place to build boats, but if you get too big, you've got to have unions, and unions are a real trouble, especially when you got to shrink your size in recessions, as we've all survived. Um, China really helped us realize that we could get the cost out. It helped us build these boats in one piece from rail to rail, and it really proved a lot of process ideas that we had and um, these are all things that we like to say apply to our next phase, which is the, um, well, I've labeled it design and innovation breakthroughs. Uh, there's another slide here that talks about brains and productivity. Uh, and that's really about bringing the manufacturing home. Um, we have set up our own yard in North Carolina. Glenn Jackman from North Carolina, just hold your hand up here, I know you're here. The state of North Carolina, which Glenn represents, has been incredible. Right to work state, no unions, the flexibility to expand and contract with the market. Probably the most positive and productive workforce I've ever worked with, and that says a lot. I've worked on five continents. Uh, Can-do attitude, we're located in a remote location in small towns, reputation means a lot. Every single person building the boats is an avid boater. These are avid, avid third, fourth generation boaters. A lot of them have fishing background, a lot of them have sailing background. Um, when we decided to relaunch to North Carolina, it was to build this new 55. And um, the background in this 55 is that we've watched people using their boats, their gunboats. And the moment anyone would, any owner got on their boats, the old boats used to have a bulkhead with doors and windows. The doors and windows would be open the entire time the owner was on the boat, they were never closed. So the first thing we'd noted over the years was, geez, we gotta get rid of that bulkhead and let's open up this whole space in the salon. And we have a uh, owner up in Finland, he sails within the Arctic Circle for about nine months out of the year. And he had a gunboat 48 with a bulkhead, but he enclosed the whole aft end so the aft cockpit would become part of the salon. I said, Bjorn, how does that work? He goes, oh, it's no problem, ice and snow. It's warm in the salon with the enclosure. And the light bulb went off. My God, we got to get rid of the salon door bulkhead and go to one of these enclosures and make one giant space that's flexible indoor and outdoor. Um, so we've designed the boat for the way the boats are used. Now you should hear what goes on at boat shows. Where's the door bulkhead? Is it warm with the uh, enclosure? That um, will go on, I'm sure, for three or four years, as it did when we showed up with a big catamaran at the first boat show saying, you know, aren't keel boats faster? Well, um, it's taken us a while to answer that question, but I think we've answered it now. Fado. <laughs> Speaking about proving a performance of a boat, this is a brand's wet dream. Um, this is a young, very bright owner who um, learned how to sail when he was on the West Coast in his 20s, bought a Roberts steel cutter, went to the Caribbean, came back and said, I need something with speed because I'm not going to go that slow again the rest of my life. And we built him this gunboat 66. And he's, his goal is to sail around the world, take in all the greatest yacht races that will allow us. There's still two that won't allow us, Bermuda Race and the Sydney Hobart. And he's slowly ticking off all the great races. He's done the Fastnet. He raced the Maltese Falcon across the Atlantic from Newport to England and beat the Maltese Falcon, the largest keelboat in the world. And uh, he produces his own videos and media content. He has his own website. And uh, I would say that of all the major milestones for the brand, 
this really stands out as one of the biggest ones because I think what it's done for the market and the bigger boat owners is that it's proved you can have a luxurious world cruiser and go kick the tail of any keelboat on the planet. This boat is beating every high performance keelboat up to about 80 or 90 feet. Um, if you look at any of our race results from the Heineken Regatta, um, we're typically DP52 to Volvo 70 speed around the course for a luxurious world cruiser. Now I think what that, that does is that um, it demonstrates that you don't need two different boats. You don't need your stripped out race boat and then some, some mega yacht that you gotta run under power most of the time. You can have one boat that really does both jobs. Um, the gunboat class, uh, Alistair talk, asked me to talk a little bit about building the brand. We originally got this class together in 2005. That's 10 years ago this, this coming season. We've had anywhere from five to seven boats. We think within two or three years we'll have 12 to 15 on the line. But in the Caribbean, each season we do between one and this year we'll do four events. And um, it's got all the owners out actively competing, which none of them really wanted to compete. These are all highly successful business people. Uh, but once they got a taste of it, they realized that in one week of racing, they learned more about their boat than in a year or two of cruising. This has been a hugely effective component of building the brand. It's also helped build a bit of a uh, cult gathering. This, um, the social aspects of typically uh, more mature owners, really gung-ho enthusiastic sailors, a lot of them in the industry, a lot of them are friends of the owners. Uh, has been a terrific mix of personalities. Um, we mentioned psychographics earlier. The typical owner is uh, either an entrepreneur or a highly successful CEO. A lot of them have run their own businesses, built them up over the years. Um, some come from family wealth. Uh, but there is this sort of focus on performance and comfort and um, wanting to sail with friends and family. I think that um, one of the main benefits of the um, new layout is that um, this layout is super family friendly. It is super friendly for the people that maybe aren't such avid sailors. When you're in the salon and you're in the salon most of the day, you've got wind protection, you have sun protection, you can have as much ventilation as you want or you can be enclosed as much as you want. So we're finding that with a lot of former oyster owners and swan owners, um, the women want to go sailing now. And this has been a huge part of the success of the boats in that the boats become a focal point of the owner's family's activity. The boats get used more because the women like to be on board. The future, um, I don't know. I think as soon as things are stable and you've established things, I fall asleep. So Sven, just raise your hand in the back. Sven's from Holland Composites. He's part of the development team on the G4. And um, we don't think it's enough to, to really hand it to a Volvo 70 with a world cruising cat. We don't think it's enough to be able to beat a Malgus 32 around the race course. We want to crush it. And, um, you know, frankly, we haven't really offered an offering for probably most of us in the room, us industry folk. I mean, but we want to go fast too. We want something for coastal sailing. We want something that if we've got a sabbatical period, we can run out to the Bahamas or the Caribbean. Uh, we can leave it on a mooring. It's light enough. If you want to drive it down a ramp, you can do that as well. This is the 40-foot G4. And um, this will be a radical, radical new product that will launch uh, in the spring next year. 
It is uh, only 2.4 tons. It's all pre-preg carbon. It's been developed by Sven and his team at Holland Composites, including uh, PJ Dworshish and Misha Hemschuk um, and Rudo Enzerink. This is an all Dutch team. And um, I came to them because I bought an A-class from them. And I was so impressed with the A-class. An A-class, if you don't know, is an 18 foot long, seven and a half foot wide, all carbon development class. It's an ISAF class. The rig's about 32 feet high, and it's the Ferrari of small boats. And once you sail one of those, all you want is that same sensation, but you want to take it up the food chain. This is an A-class on steroids. Um, it'll be faster than the old Formula 40 class. In certain conditions, I'm told it should be quicker than the new GC32, which is impressing everyone, a terrific boat. It'll be the first cruising boat to fully foil. Sounds like madness, doesn't it? But I can tell you from flying the A-Class, a flying boat's actually a lot easier to steer, it's a lot easier to sail. Um, it's less treacherous in trying conditions. So the whole foil package is actually easier, better, higher performance. If you're out for a day sail with a family, you don't have to put the uh, cant in the foils. You can keep the hulls in the water if you like. People used to make fun of us for flying hulls during sea trials. People used to make <laughs> question our sanity for flying hulls in the racing. Now I can't wait to hear what they say when we fly both hulls as we're sailing past them. We think that there's um, large areas of development to come in the foils, in the rig packages, and in the layouts. The real beauty of this catamaran space is that, you know, it's only been around a decade or two. It's not like a kill boat where Sparkman and Stevens pretty much nailed it in the 1930s with layouts, and everything's been a refinement since. I mean, it's been almost eight decades of the same damn refinement in kill boats. Cats, it's wide open. We're only in the second decade or so of, of good stuff. It's a really exciting time to be in this industry. Um, we've got bigger boats coming. This is the new G7. This is a 70 footer that really uh, builds upon the Gunboat 55 concept. Um, we believe we'll have four of these underway in the coming year. This boat will sail upwind at 13, 14 knots and off the wind it's no problem to get above 30. When we first pulled in the Newport with Tribe, I meant to mention this at the beginning of the talk, just to tie the whole talk together. I had a mooring out in front of the New York Yacht Club. Whew, you should have heard the grief I took the whole first summer. We were the only multi-hull in all of Newport Harbor. Newport Harbor moors or docks 3,200 boats. We were the only multi-hull. Um, this photo is going to get me in all sorts of trouble. The New York Yacht Club already asked me to take this down off of my Facebook page. Um, this is a Gunboat 60, a uh, New York Yacht Club member. It's a sister ship to a Gunboat 60 we're building now for the future Commodore of the New York Yacht Club. So 15 years, come a long way. Man, there's a lot still left to do. Um, I think that, you know, we saw a need. There was no offerings. We dove in head first. Sometimes it was shoal water, sometimes it was deep. And um, it's a segment that I think we've only just scratched the surface after 15 years. In my experience with any new concept, whether it's spritz or skiffs or cats, it's 15 15 years minimum just to get the public's attention and then it's the next 15 years which are really great about spreading the word so thanks a lot I just wanted to play one quick video here I'm gonna lean on Amanda to do that for me <clears throat> it's a video of one of our owners and this is up on Forbes magazine's website
Well, we're this getting set up there, Peter. Uh, swear was totally queued up. Yeah, well, well, well it's, it's going in a second, but uh, that was, I think, I think, I'm sure you can all appreciate why I asked Peter to make a presentation. That was, uh, that's true innovation. You epitomise innovation. Isn't one of the problems with a foiling cruising boat the fact that you get there too fast? I mean, is, is, isn't the pleasure in the journey rather than the destination? And you go somewhere on one of those things, you're there before you know it. That's great. So maybe uh, it makes you reverse the aging process or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, the faster you go, the wider your cruising grounds, the more choices. I'll give you an example. From Newport to Martha's Vineyard, 54 miles to Town. With that G4, we're going to be doing that in two and a half hours. With a keelboat, that's a two or three day trip. And uh, two hours is great for family. Two or three days offshore with a family, not so fun. Um, if you're in the Caribbean or Bahamas and you want to skip some of the more sketchy islands, you can do 100 miles with a nice, easy day sail. So I think you know if you want to go slow, keep the thing in the water, put up small sails, have your cocktail cruise. But if it's me, I'll take the, uh, the range and the, the additional choices any day. Next question. The appendages on the G4, are they all four retractable or? All four are retractable. So like all of our gunboats, um, when your rudders are up and your dagger boards are up or center boards, you only draw about a foot or two. So you should be able to jump, jump off into knee deep water and uh, start your day in the new anchorage. Next question. I was just looking for the website address of that guy on Fado. You said uh, does videos of his trips. Like that's the kind of stuff I love to put on our website because people click on it all day. I think it's teamfado.com. If you Google Fado and gunboat, you'll find it. No, from 50 seconds in. Perfect. lend themselves to great sailing without the drama and you can really enjoy it as you can tell when you look at this boat it's open wide free easy uh, fun and certainly beautiful to my wonderful gunboat. Oh, good to be home. It's a remarkable disruptive boat. And in the world I live in, which is the world of startup disruptive technology, this is a startup disruptive technology. The design is all 100% carbon fiber. Um, what does that mean? It means that it's light and it's strong and rigid, um, so that when you actually are out sailing, you're, you, you've got authority in the water. It takes you where you want to go. All the tech that's on the boat is all the amenities. Peter Johnstone had a vision. He said, let's make a boat that can be fast, be stable and luxurious at the same time. Those three don't usually go well together in the sailing community. This boat is the embodiment of it, and in fact, the first one of its kind in the world. Peter Johnstone, great story. Thanks very much. <laughs>